Well, hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, this is Patrick Milliken from the Poison Pen Bookstore in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. And it is my treat and honor to have my friend Luis Alberto Urrea with me today, uh, the master, to talk about his brand new book, Good Night Irene, which is just a tremendous piece of work. And, um, you know, I think I first, I first uh, became aware of you, like everybody, I think, when Across the Wire came out you know, and just have followed your career avidly since then. And um, this, uh, what a special book. Uh, anyway, first of all, welcome, Luis. It's great to see you again. Thank you, brother. Yeah. And we were talking, he, Luis has been on the road for almost a month, right? Promoting the book. And so I'm going to make him tell a lot of stories that he's already <laughs> told, I'm sure. But, um, you know, it's just a sort of an introduction. Uh, Tell us a little bit about what kind of inspired the book. And I know it's been kind of percolating for a good 20 plus years, right? Oh, yeah. Probably my whole life, actually. My mom uh, was in World War II. Uh, she was a Red Cross operative, but she was in a, a service that has been forgotten almost entirely called the Club Mobile Corps. And the Club Mobile Corps the vernacular nickname was Donut Dollies. And, um, you know, they drove two and a half ton GMC six by trucks with a galley on the flatbed in the back built on. So they were the world's biggest van. It looked, it looked like the predecessor to our RVs actually. Um, and uh, it had serving windows on the sides and inside they had a galley with coffee makers, donut machines, Victrola. and then cups, huh? And a Victrola. They did, they had on a swivel in the back, a record player they would drop and there were speakers on top of the truck. And so the ladies were asked to go into the war and be America for those boys, to be the face of, of, of compassion and kindness to be, as they were told, you are to be their girlfriend, their sister, their cousin, their auntie, even their mom. Um, but don't be too much of a girlfriend. And their confidant. <laughs> and their confidant. Everything. Yeah. Everything. You, they were hope on two legs. Um, there were three women to the truck. My mother was on a truck called the Cheyenne. And, uh, you know, the short form, just so people know when they, if they read the book, but um, every historical marker through the book actually taken from my mother's personal experience of the war. Everything awful, scary, gnarly, all of it inspired in one way or the other or directly taken from her experience. And then I, I fictionalized it. Um, and uh, my mother, Phyllis, uh, her middle name was Irene. Little little inside stuff so you can maybe understand how close it is to the bone for me. Um, and the driver of the truck, who's turning out to be the superstar, I think, of the story, Dorothy, uh, was my mother's truck driver. And her name was Jill Pitts. And this is an interesting little story that you may appreciate, but my mother was 5'3". And Jill Pitts was about six one, and the soldiers used to call them Mutt and Jeff, like the cartoons in the newspapers. And um, my mom was from New York, a, a sort of socialite debutante from a good family. Yeah, there they are. There they are. If you lift it up just a little bit, that is the 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 cutie pie uh, on the side. That's my mom in her uniform. That's all three of them with their third person. That's my mom's patch. That's them with GIs at the bottom. But if you look all the way next to the uniform picture, the dark picture of the three women, my mother is the one in the little vest looking cutie booty. And the, the middle one is Jill. And then the third woman is a woman named Helen. And at the bottom where they're in a window and they're looking up, they're watching, they're watching bombers fly overhead. And that, <clears throat> that house is in Glatton, England. It's a thatched roof 
house built in the 15th century. They were bivouacked there. They would ride their bicycles to the air base to attend to the flyers. Um, and the cool thing is, especially for our friends in LA in the movie biz, it was a two story house. And the ground floor was inhabited by John Ford's film crew. And so the ladies were just in heaven because they were safe. They had a constant cocktail party going day and night, picnics at any time. Um, and they were living the high life. It was before I think they understood what they were really in for. And the touching thing for me as, the, as her son and the, the dad of a daughter, who's exactly her size. She was 5'3", and my daughter's 5'3". But I think she's 5'2", and is adding an inch, you know. But um, <laughs> but to take her there, she'd never met her grandmother and didn't know much about her. And to go and say, look, there's the window, because she had seen the picture. That's the window. That was where your grandmother sat. And it's, was still there. There. it's still there, man. And the air base is still there. And, you know, we went to the air base, and... The, the, there are men who take care of it. And, you know, the landing strips are, are unbelievably long hmm. and, because of those big B-17s. And uh, he says to me, would you like to go walk it? And we I was like, yeah, I would like to walk it. And we took my daughter, her name is Chayo. And we started walking. And when we got far away from everybody, he said, you know, if you come out here at dawn, you can still hear the bombers. So, whoa, right? And he he stopped and he went off of the tarmac. It's the original tarmac. It's got all the signs and painting and numbers. And he dug into the dirt in the high grass and he pulled a, a chunk of asphalt and he handed it to me and he said, you should take this home. The original landing strip and I think you should have it because your mom might have stood on it. Yeah, it still gives me chills. I've got it on my desk. But, you know, it, it was that kind of trip that all this stuff started manifesting and happening. And uh, I'll be quiet in just a second. You're probably thinking, dude, are you going to talk all night? But no. <laughs> have some coffee. I, I, I got this. No. Um, so... Everybody we thought was dead, everybody. My mother died uh, in 1990. And we thought everybody involved in this was gone. And we thought, especially that the Jill, who was Dorothy in the novel or, or fictionalized as Dorothy, we thought she had died for, for things my mother had hinted at. You know, if, if you're dealing with somebody with PTSD, really bad PTSD, you, you don't get a lot of stories about wh what happened. And, and when she talked, it was sometimes frustratingly nebulous and sometimes shockingly direct. You could never tell, you know, what mom would, would do. But uh, we were researching, Cindy and me, because we do everything together. Um, and she found in my mother's papers, uh, a little thing that Jill herself had typed up her story. Uh, and it was old and the paper was yellow, but there was a, uh, an address label stuck on the back, an old brown aged address label. And she lived in Champaign. We live in Naperville, Illinois. She was 90 minutes in her life from where we lived. And I think Cindy thought, well, let, let's, you know, let's track this woman down and see if she's alive. And she was alive. And uh, she was 94. And uh, we wrote her. She called us. I was losing it, you know, because I thought this is this is the past on two legs. And this is the person who knew my mother. When was this, by the way? About 10 years ago or? No, nope. 2014. 2014. I, heard, I just heard from the boss. Um, yeah. 2014. Yeah. And uh, we drove down there. And the reason I'm telling you this, well, a couple of things. She was fabulous. She really was. And um, we went to her door and understand that, 
you know, she as portrayed in the book, but more sophisticated. She was a Hoosier from farm people, right? She's an Indiana gal. She was then six foot one. Um, at 94, she was no longer six foot one. She was small, um, but she wasn't gonna call me Luis. Forget about it, man. I was Lewis, Lewis, Lewis. And she got on the phone and she said, Lewis, you must come see me. I said, yes, Miss Jill, we're gonna come down this week. And she said, I'm 94 years old. Don't try to wait till I turn 95 if you catch my drift. And I thought, oh my God, this woman is amazing already. You know, I thought, I'm sorry, darling, but I, I got a crush, sorry. And we drove down to see her. We knocked on her door and this is where the novel came from, for real. Knocked on the door, she opened it. She was delightful, charming, ancient. She always, she had a chance, wanted to hold hands or put her arm through mine. She liked a, she liked a bow, you know? So I was walking her into her house and I see on the wall a framed portrait of my mother. Oh my God. I freaked out and you gotta know about my mother is she thought she was a 1940s starlet. And when I see my mom, she's in her pose like this. And I was just looking at it and Jill said to me, I drove the truck but your mother brought the joy. And it just was, it was, you know, a lightning bolt because I thought, this is my mom at 27. This is my mom at the height of her powers, not, not wounded, not, she's just glowing. And it made me rethink her and re-see her because I had all of her photos. And I went back and realized if you're looking at the photos, through the lens of your troubled and difficult mom, who was still delightful in little jobs, or through the lens of this 27-year-old gorgeous woman. I saw every one of her pictures after meeting Jill, and in every one on the front, she looks happy. All of them, she's just a glow. And it, it, it was so wrenching, you know? It was, and I knew I had to, I had to write it, but I had to do them justice. And I had to really find out. Fortunately, Jill was a super careful record keeper and uh, my mom, not so much, but she had a ton of stuff. So I had this big bin of all of her things and her letters and her journals, her diaries, her photographs, her letters, you know, her citations. I have a I have a citation from Harry S. Truman. I was like, because Harry S. Truman's autograph, how cool is that? A combat ribbon that the Red Cross gave them. Um, but Miss Jill had it all very neatly, neatly taken care of. And she had the actual map she used to drive. It's in the book, you know, you see the yeah, map. Uh, yeah. That's the map and she, it was in her house. So we knew her till she passed at 102. Amazing. Yeah. So the book came out of those things. And the last little detail I'll, I'll throw out historically is they have vanished because, well, a lot of reasons, but the men didn't really take it seriously, the men in charge. And I don't think the army wanted them to be getting all this attention, but they were there. They were there. And when my articles started coming out, the first one was a piece in the New York Times and sure enough the mansplainers showed up you know and these guys are like they never even heard a bullet they were in the rear and this guy said to in his letter I've read all the books I've seen the films I know and I thought well thanks for making my point Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, you know the Red Cross building burned down that had the records so officially they vanished and in pop culture they vanished and Miss Jill held a big grudge. She was pissed off at Stephen Ambrose. She was furious with Steven Spielberg. And she really was mad at Tom Brokaw. And she kept telling me, we were there. Stephen Ambrose wrote about the, the band of brothers and where were we? Saving Private Ryan, we were parked in those towns. 
And then she said about Brokaw, who was doing the Greatest Generation stuff, remember, on, on the news and I, that series about the war. And she said, I wrote to him and I told him, I told him in the citations and all these things. He never answered me. And I wrote again. And his secretary sent me a letter and said, that's very interesting. And if we have a minute, we'll mention you all. And they never did. And so she would not speak his name. She called him that one with the hair. You know, that one with the hair on TV. <laughs> I said, yes, I do. So she held that grudge forever. And I thought, you know, let's set that record straight. Let's, let's find out all we can about this. And we traveled all over Europe several times, every war museum, you know, I actually got to see their uniforms which was great and crawl around trucks. The actual donut trucks are all gone. Everything's gone. There isn't a single one left, huh? Huh? There isn't a single one that you've been able to find? No, I've got a picture. I can send pictures to you later if you want, but I've got a picture of her actual truck, which was abandoned in Germany. And it's a picture, a, a, a fan of donut dollies from Spain. Go figure, you know, I, I don't um, Lovely guy, but he sent me the picture and it's out in a field. And I was like, are those donut dollies? And he says, no, those are hippies. <laughs> <laughs> There's hippies in the truck, you know. Um, the, I know there are reenactors in England, but the, the English donut dollies drove English buses. So they've got a reconstructed bus. However, I invite you to join me. We're going to go to Gettysburg because... There's a little tiny mom and pop history museum and somebody, they, they rebuilt one on a GMC truck. So they've got, they've got a, a, you know, a, an exact replica. Right. So all, all, all my movie friends just know there's one sitting <laughs> at Gettysburg if you need it, but it's cool. You know, it's an amazing experience. Now, had your mom um, been in touch with Jill over the years or no? My mother aware of each other's existence. Oh yeah, but yeah. Um, I, I'm sure a lot of folks watching have similar experiences. But you know, one of the things that happens is I think you become more isolated. And when my mother got back, it, 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 my mother was severely injured at the end of the war. And her the legs. Accident is based on her own experience then. Oh, yeah. And her legs were almost torn off and she had scars all over her thighs and legs and her stomach was torn apart. She had horrible scars across her abdomen. Um, and when she came home, she came home probably in 46 because she had a long recuperation. Luckily for her, part of it was in France. And she discovered, uh, uh, you know, villages, uh, little places that were sacred to her. And I think that that got her back. But she went to, home to New York. And one of the first things that she would talk about was, well, one thing she would always say is, dear boy, it was no longer New York. New York was gone. And the second thing she told me years later was, my family didn't believe me about the Holocaust. I just couldn't stay. And so she left in 1947, never went back. She'd go back because she became a jewelry buyer in San Francisco for iMagnet. So she would go back, but I don't think she saw her relatives, maybe her mom. Um, and uh, so she left that in 47 and went to Sausalito and lived on a houseboat. My mom, the Bohemian, you know. Um, did, she know she, did she know Sterling Hayden? <laughs> I wish. He, I was wish he, was, he was there. Yeah. Too. I wish he was my grandpa. Oh, but man. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, she was there. And um, she and Jill stayed friends until 1954. And then she disappeared. Um, and the secret was that nobody knew is that she met my dad, this dashing Mexican army captain who was, 
you know, from Mexican Irish stock. I, I, I may have told you this at an earlier meeting, but my grandmother, his mom, her name was Guadalupe McMurray. So she was, you know, she was the queen of a tribe of, of blonde and red haired Mexicans. Um, and they met in San Francisco and they married in City Hall. And I think she was hoping, she was always looking for an escape from the inferno insider. And he was, he was a Latin lover, man. He talked that game and it turned bad. And I think that's when she gave up. And so uh, Jill couldn't believe it. I tried to tell Jill about it. And she was just so shocked. And she said, well, I didn't know she had a son. And I said, yeah, it's because, you know, she stopped talking to you the year before I was born. So <laughs> very weird. It's hard. To, it's hard to process. So talk a little bit about, I mean, approaching this massive story to tell. I mean, you do such a wonderful job of recreating the vibe in the country, on the street, you know, as these, you know, we're focusing on at first, it's these three girls, Irene, uh, Dorothy, and then Ellie, who bailed. Ellie from Chicago. <laughs> yeah, she's a pistol, man. Um, but there's a, what I thought was a really great scene early on in the book where uh, uh, Irene is on a train and um, this guy fresh from the war on leave who's lost his leg yeah, comes in and sits down to her. Uh, what a great scene. It reminded Thank me, of, it reminded me of, um, you know, like the, the, the early parts of Moby Dick, you know, before the voyage and you're in, you're in the pub with all these grizzled veterans who've been, right. out, who, who've been out there you know they've been out at sea and it's that kind of vibe um talk a little bit about that you know it was so difficult to figure out how to parse out this story and i was starting to understand that it's truly an epic not about gnarly men but about women young women yeah 27 years old and my mother, it, it begins, by the way, I steal the first word of the novel from Hemingway, her favorite author, a little message for me to mom, but A Movable Feast, which was one of her favorite books, begins with the word then. And when I first read it, I thought, you sly bastard. You begin with the word then. We are in the middle of the story in the first word. <laughs> and I'd never seen anybody else do it. So I stole it. And, and that's how I started you know um and i thought sh she was escaping a difficult and violent relationship and my mother prided herself and i don't remember the phrase in the book i call her the empress of escapes or something she called herself something like that once that she would simply go away and do something else if they were bothering her and she would tell me sometimes that she jumped out her bedroom window once when she was feeling uncomfortable and took off. Second story, pew. Um, it, once she had a fight with her mother and 13 years old, took the ferry. They lived on Staten Island in, in a beautiful part of Staten Island. I went because I'd never been, by the way, researching this, thinking I was gonna find all these forests and deer. It's not what I found on Staten Island. Found good bagels though, really good bagels. But um, she, she went to New York, got on a Ford Trimotor at 13 with the money she stole out of mom's cookie jar, flew to West Virginia to see her Aunt Sarah. And Aunt Sarah finally called back to New York and she said, it's lovely having the child here, but when are you taking her back? And my grandmother said, is she gone? They didn't even notice. So my mother, you know, she escaped and she was she had read about this service every one of the men in the family had fought in world war one and her favorite and i've just realized this in fact just in the endless car trip we're having we decided to drive the tour i'll tell you about that later but that was stupid um she was she, i just realized this that she had this, this uncle named uncle tom Uncle Tom, and there's only one picture of him. And he's 
he looks so sensitive and like a poet, horn room glasses and Montgomery Clift kind of a guy, right? And he came back with it and nobody knew what to do with him, shell shock. And they had property uh, in Mattituck, Long Island, the family did. Uh, and they had to make him a cabin on the land to live in by himself. And the family had a wit, so they called it Uncle Tom's Cabin. And he stayed in there um, and she loved him to death and they would go on walks and so forth. And out of the blue, he hung himself. So I think that, and it just occurred to me recently, seriously, like two weeks ago, that I think one of the motivations to go serve those soldiers was Uncle Tom. I just never thought about it. So, you know, she'd read about this service, the Club Mobile Corps, and it sounded both uh, patriotic and uh, an adventure. How lovely to make donuts for the boys, you know? Uh, I think she was honestly seeing herself as some, some actress in a role. I really do, you know? Bing Crosby in White Christmas. <laughs> Maybe she thought, yeah, I don't know what she thought. And um, they, they all went to Washington, D.C. And uh, they stayed, all stayed in a couple of hotels, most of them in one hotel that's in the book. Um, and then they, they went into training and they had to learn to make donuts and they had to learn how to make coffee and, you know, all the weird rules of the Red Cross for them, to them that were weird. Um, one of the things that always gets women in the audience their ire up is that they were trained to play all the card games, play poker, whatever, and play board games, whatever it was they were playing back in those days. But they were trained to always lose. Hmm. Try that one on. Always lose or act like you lose so that once you've lost, the guy feels good about himself. It was all about lifting these boys up. Right. But there was nobody there to lift these women up. Right. And so then early on, you know, they get assigned to uh, to the, the base in England. And they go as part of this. Uh, and I'm not really giving spoilers away because it's really early on in the book. But it is, it is. There are a couple of experiences early on that really open their eyes about what they're actually getting into. Oh, yeah. Um, you know. That, that convoy, they go on the ship, you know, and they're zigzagging through the North Sea and uh, a ship ahead of them gets torpedoed. Um, is that based on your mother's experience? No, you know, the, the really, well, they did do that. She didn't see a ship sunk, but I realized that these women were going to be our witnesses for everything. And as I was writing the book, and it took a long time to write it and many, many, many versions of it, but veterans, who knew what I was doing would tell me stuff that they wouldn't tell anybody else. And one of them who's a, in the extended family through Cindy, uh, Papa, Papa Bill, and he and I became besties. And every time I came to Arizona, we'd go out, you know, and we'd, we'd eat carnitas. And he started telling me this story. He was in the Merchant Marine in World War II and they were in a convoy coming up out of South America and the U-boats were everywhere off Argentina and so forth. And they were under strict rules to go full speed ahead and never stop. And if a ship was hit, sucks to be them, keep going. And he was, he was the witness on the deck that night when that happened. And the men, he said it's, it, it haunted him for 80 years, you know? or however old he was, but the men could see him and they were calling to him in the dark, please, please, buddy, please, please. And they just disappeared in the back to their deaths and he never got over it. So I thought, I'm going to try to incorporate everything I can learn, you know, if what, everything people will tell me or whatever I can research. Um, so yeah, that, that was something, that was a true experience. Um, but my mother's journey across was the same. And I thought, you know, I realized there, this, this was turning into kind of a medieval hero's journey, Absolutely. but for women, 
right? It's the heroine's journey. And they get exposed to more and more and more threatening things. And they choose to go forward. More and more things that want to stop them and they choose to do their duty. Um, and then it turns cataclysmic at a certain moment. Yeah. Right. And then, you know, briefly they're in, you know, they, they go to London and they get a, a sense of what uh, what life is like under the Blitz, you know, and you see the, you know, you describe the, the buildings that are, you know, literally cut down the side and you have glimpses into people's living spaces. Yeah. They look like dollhouses. Yeah. You can see their furniture, yeah. That whole blitz period, I don't know why it's so fascinating uh, to me. You know, I remember reading Graham Greene, you know, oh, his, yeah. his writing about that. You know, he did a lot uh, right on yeah. the street reportage. Yeah. There. yeah well, the, 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 there's a buzz bomb scene. That's, that's true. Yeah. That was my mom's experience. Not what happens after it falls because I wanted to give a representation. And since she's our viewpoint character, I'm trying to keep the camera on her as much as possible. And then Jill is the sidekick. And there does come a moment when, you know, like my mom is, or, or Irene, I should say, you know, is Dorothy's companion, almost like a mascot, because Dorothy's got it together. And then something changes. And my mother now takes <laughs> care of her. Dorothy, and breaks. Dorothy breaks at at some point. She sure does. Dear but um, <laughs> the 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 scene where Irene is having a bubble bath, yeah, that was yeah. my mom, and they were up at the bomber base, and they had to go back to the Grovner Hotel, which is a beautiful hotel that survived the Blitz. It had thousands of sandbags all the way around it, so nothing it would it, the windows wouldn't blow out or anything, and it was the officers' mess. And their whole shtick there was feed the boys all the American food they can eat. Huge roasts, you know, lobsters, shrimp, all this stuff. American, American pies. But a lot of it because the boys, you know, they were eating rations or they were eating British style. They didn't really like it. So one of the rules was you had to eat, 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 eat. And the other gals in the truck didn't want to keep doing it. So they stayed at the air base, but my mother, now that you know my mother, and certainly by extension, Irene, now that you kind of know Irene, thought, hey, the most luxurious hotel in London, and I get a room, I have a bathtub, you know, I have a toilet, I have a bidet, I have, a, I have, a, I have people serving me, I have bubble baths, are you kidding? And that's why the character says on her way, one, sometimes one just has to suffer. She was very dry. And she was in the bathtub, dude. Bubble bath, glass of white wine, luxuriating. And she heard the weird sound. And the, the, the wall at the foot of the bathtub had a window. And I think it was octagonal or round, but it was a, a shapely window. And she heard this bizarre sound. And she always told me it sounded like a malfunctioning Model T, this sputtering <laughs> sound. And she looked out the window and a flock of pigeons just whoosh. And then she said this huge gray shark went across the window. And it looked like there was a bazooka on the back and it was spitting flame and sparks. And then she saw swastika on it and she got up out of the bath stood on the rim of the tub naked running bubble bath and looked over the edge of the window and the engine shut off and it fell and it blew her back into the bathtub that was that was a true experience so i thought how lucky i am that i have so many people who really lived the stuff that i need to imagine they really help me because, you know, they can put this scene in your mind and then you, you, you're There's the imaginary, like you're a director, you know, it's basically, yeah. There's a lot of, po right. there's a lot of poetry in there too. And there's a lot of, there's something of the sublime in a lot of this destruction. You know what I mean? I remember reading uh, again, back to Graham Greene when he was talking about 
when the Germans would send these delicate flares down to light up, to light up the ground below them. And, yeah. uh, you know, they're just the, the image of that and how, you know, people on the ground were like, oh my God, <laughs> you know, just incredible. Wow. And so then, okay, so this is the end of the tail end, if I'm not mistaken, of 1943, right? And we all know what's coming. You know, yes. the word on this, there's the word around something big is happening, you know, and of course it's the uh, D Day is coming. Yeah. And, yeah. Course, uh, um, and so, I mean, I don't, I, I don't want to take away too much of, um, of everybody's reading experience here, but you really take these, uh, these women on a trip, you know, and on a journey, you know, and they, they go in right behind it. They're, I think they're assigned at first to Utah Beach, right? Utah. They landed on Utah Beach. It was. It, they went six days after the invasion. And what's interesting about it is my mom saw that buzz bomb, and Irene, by extension, that was sent as punishment. And uh, I've read various things that they said it was twelve days or thirteen days. So her memory was six days, but I think they went probably on the fifteenth day. I don't know, but that's why they went land on Utah Beach because the you know the Brits had some, the Americans had some, but it was already landed and Patton was on his way heading for France. So they 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 landed on the beach, they took off following the third army, caught up to them. And one of the things they were trained to do, which is also interesting, was to forget. Any orders they got, they were trained techniques to forget them. Because if the Germans got hold of them, it could be catastrophe. And they're also given officer's rank, hoping that the Geneva Conventions would protect them from atrocities. And off they go. You know, my mom joked with me once, yes, I liberated Europe with, not with a pistol, my finger in a donut hole. I was like, mom, that's cool. <laughs> Um, and they went and they, you know, and there's, there was so much stuff that I couldn't get it all in the book. I didn't want to write another Hummingbird's Daughter, you know, 500 page long book. Uh, look at this guy. You've got props. This is on cue. Also kind of disturbingly, I have this prop. Hey, oh, Man. nice. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I had to cut some stuff out, but, you know, just so you know, for the record, they went all the way across Western Europe. They took part in the liberation of Paris. They took part in the liberation of Brussels. They were in the siege of Bastogne. They were trapped in the Battle of the Bulge. Jill's brother, one of the reasons she joined was she wanted to be at the front because her brother had gone. She didn't wanna be in the rear. And if she wasn't going to be allowed to fight, she was going to be there. And she saw her brother for his birthday. And the next day, he was in the next town north of Bastogne. He was killed by the Germans. Wow. That's, and then they were trapped in the Battle of the Bulge. They made it all the way through the Bulge with crazy things, some of it in the novel. Um, and then they followed Patton all the way to Weimar. And when they were in Weimar, then he came to them and said, I need you to go up on the mountain. And they didn't know what was going on. They thought it was a POW camp for pilots, for American boys, you know. And then from their catastrophe for my mom. But it was a, it was a wild journey. And, you know, it, it lent itself weirdly to uh, dramatization. There were three acts. And then I thought I'm going to be perverse and add a fourth act. Yeah. So, so act one is the period up to Utah beach, really. Right. Well, yeah, no, I, I, to me, yeah, I guess, I guess up to the bomber base and then Utah okay. beach is this other thing. And then uh, what happens certainly after Buchenwald is the third act. Um, and, you know, I, you know that I love mysteries. It's my favorite reading. You know that. Um, so I, I've, I've become friends with Greg Hurwitz. Everybody buy his books. He's a genius. But um, I've been helping him with his Spanish and, uh, you know, with Latino themes. And, you know, mystery writers do cool stuff. So he named the 
the evil narco god Urea. I was like, thanks, bro. That was nice. Um, but I told him because he liked the ending, and I said, I'm glad you liked it because I stole it from you guys. I was doing a rope a dope. I'm not going to talk about it here, but no, 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 you no. know, I want I wanted there to be delight uh, every page if I could, and I wanted there to be satisfaction. You know what I mean? I didn't want to be a difficult auteur who doesn't care if you're happy or not. I I was writing this for my mom. If that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, and you want to give your mom something beautiful, and sometimes right. you got to go through all the horror to get to the beauty. So, can I just kind of scatter around and ask you some various short questions here? All right. um, one of them is about, well, you know, you mentioned early on that the role that, uh, that these women came to came to uh, occupy, you know, were very, you know, morale boosters. Um, somewhere in the book, they felt like war brides to a thousand soldiers um and then tellingly for me i mean there's a there's a point in the book where they're they really become confidants and they hear these soldiers confessions about and they're difficult confessions they're and terrible I, this is but they the, don't have anyone to talk to you know how can you tell your friends that moment in the book when the guy tells one of them i i kissed another man on the mouth is something wrong with me can I read this real quick? Yeah, go for it. This is, uh, folks, this is early on, but for me, I mean, this is the kind of stuff you don't read about a lot in in, in World War II fiction. And um, I was gonna ask you too about Charles Williford, you know, and his wonderful memoir, uh, Something About a Soldier. Yeah. His World War II poetry, which, yeah. which gets into this really difficult kind of area. Okay, here it goes. One boy, um, let's see here. Uh, yeah, 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 let's see. The boys would find them. They needed to talk, and the women learned to be quiet and receptive and never criticize the nightmares and shame the boys had come to tell them in secret. It was the great unburdening. Uh, they vowed never to share these secrets with anyone else, although they did whisper about them to each other after midnight. And though they carried a shell of strangers' sorrow that grew ever thicker, um, I should probably have you read this, but one boy had stomped a civilian to death and didn't know why. Another had hidden under a fallen barn wall during a firefight, crying in terror without firing a single shot. And that one was going to shoot himself because his hands couldn't stop shaking and he couldn't stop throwing up and he couldn't sleep. Still another boy had kissed a fellow soldier and was afraid of him now. Uh, a captain had brought them his dear John letter from a woman in San Francisco and wrung his hands as they read it. It smelled like Chanel number no. five, which Irene and Dorothy found especially cruel. <laughs> um, wow, that was for me a really crucial scene in this book. You know, you really Thanks. get you really get a sense that war is messy and complicated and messes with you. And you know, the residue a lot of these guys came home with based on these kinds of experiences. There's another, there's another great scene where this soldier is, has shit his pants. Yeah. Such an amount of shame about it. Um, so, wow, just amazing stuff. And it's, it's funny because Irene at that point becomes a mom, doesn't she? She's like, oh no, don't be silly. You know, and I, I come out, come, come here. No, I can't, I'm too ashamed. And she said, tells him basically I you know we've seen everything just you can't walk around soiled like this you know and she boils his pants and all this and um it's 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 just it, it was so moving to me and you know one thing that that fueled some of this stuff was that my mother because she disappeared didn't you know her her connection to people vanished and she didn't have a single letter from anybody. She had a couple of poems, but nobody's letters. And Jill had all the letters. And, uh, you know, Cindy and I, when Jill died, the university has made a, a Jill Pitts archive. Um, and after the funeral and so forth, they just gave us all of her material one last time, a whole day with it. Nobody there you know, do have at it. 
and uh, we found the letters. And so the letters, not all of them in the book, but every letter from a GI uh, has a root in the actual letters. And you could see these kind of things, how you comforted me or this one beautiful letter where a guy said we were so scared coming off the troop ship. And then we saw your faces. We saw your eyes, you know, and I, I see your eyes. Those were so beautiful. Uh, and so I thought, yeah, there are all these, there's all these angles uh, to one's existence that you, you can't imagine, right? Um, and so every time there was an opportunity for grace, I thought it was really important because I don't want it to seem like uh, a Lee Marvin man with a burp gun World War II movie, because it wasn't. Uh, it was something different. And a lot of it was my mother's terrors. You know, my mother, nightmare every night, every night. Really, every night? Just about, yeah. It was a rare night when she was okay. And you couldn't wake her up. You couldn't touch her. Or she would lose it. Um, and, I, you know, I've been telling some of the interviewers about it, but I sometimes attribute my writing life to my mom because by the time I got my teens, I was an insomniac. I didn't sleep. And I was up all night listening to her. And that was, that was kind of strange. And, uh, you know, it was, I say this almost as a joke, but it's true. It was me in my boxers and Leonard Cohen. And, uh, you know, if you listen to Leonard long enough and you like to read, you start realizing something really interesting is happening here and I want to do it. So I ended up with a notebook. And but when that happened, I was toast. I could never stop. But old Leonard and, uh, you know, of course, Jim Morrison, let's be honest. But, you know, and other singers, Bob Dylan, some of it. But it was just this avalanche of words. And then I was listening to, you know, Spanish songwriters from España and from Argentina. And, was, and since I'm bilingual, it was just this avalanche coming in. And of course, I'm reading Richard Broad again and Kurt Vaughn again and every, everything I can get. Everything I could get at the used paperback store. You know that one where you give them two old uh, John D. McDonald mysteries and they give you back, you know, a free whatever. That's that's how I got books. That and a library card. But I was reading constantly. But my nightlife was Leonard and me, man. Wow. So yeah, I was I was uh, it was it was difficult. I'm not sure. I don't have a certain. I wouldn't take the credit for anything like PTSD, but there's a lot of mourning and difficult emotions in there still. Um, but this book was such a, it, it was a, a deliverance, you know, to tell mom, I understand finally, and it's okay. I'm gonna what make the- your, Yeah, what was, your, what was your relationship like with with her kind of growing up? Was it a, a difficult kind of complicated one it was complicated it was it was difficult she was difficult you couldn't really tell what was set her off um but she was also fun and she was vivacious in little jibs and jabs and it got harder as she got older i think she hated becoming older very much um she felt forgotten and cast aside and she was dealing with the mistake of having married my dad. Um, and, you know, just to double down on the misery in our house, they they did separate. Um, but for they never slept in the same room. They barely talked to each other. Um, and he himself had PTSD from what happened in the Mexican military. So it was not only my mom, but it was him grinding his teeth so hard he shattered all of his teeth man this was a this was a crazy house and uh and and then she'd flip out and i i remember coming home one day and she had found under his mattress you know those magazines american nudist or whatever these nudie magazines and she had lit a bonfire in the backyard and she was tearing every magazine he owned apart and burning it and she went after me I understand things like Playboy, but not filth like this. I was like, 
I'm sorry I came home. I just come home from ninth grade and there's hell in my house. So you never knew what would be so, what would happen. Um, and the moment I think, the couple of moments when I was in fourth grade, I opened up her army locker that she had against her will. She didn't know I was doing it. And I found her Buchenwald pictures. Wow. Imagine trying to explain that to your child. So that was the first time, because she knew I'd been in there. And uh, she asked me, did you see some pictures? I'll never forget it. And I was trying to figure out how to lie to her. And I said, yeah. And so she sat down and in you know, fourth grade was my first serious talk with my mom about this. And so she would let things out. Okay. But when Patton came out, the movie, I love this story. And this will give you maybe an idea of the war in her, right? She knew him. She dealt with him. She talked to him. Uh, and she came and woke me up in the morning. And she said, dear boy, we're going to go down and see a movie downtown. And I said, really? What are we going to see? And she said, Patton. And I thought, oh, my God. George C. Scott. <laughs> yes, sir. Last thing I wanted to see was a movie about an army general. And we took the bus to the California Theater downtown San Diego. We saw it three times. She never wanted to leave. Unfortunately, there was another war movie, so it was a double feature. So we saw Patton, then this other movie, then Patton, then this other movie, and then Patton. And I thought, I'm going to die in here with my mom. But she was transported, and I loved the movie. And she would lean over to me, and she'd say, oh, those pistols. Those pistols. that They got that right. Oh, yes, he did shoot at that airplane, you know. Oh, and every every one of the showings, when he hit the boy with battle fatigue, the PTSD kid, she would say to me every time, he, he shouldn't have done that. He just didn't understand. He really shouldn't have done that. That was the worst thing he ever did. And I was thinking, wow, right? We get on the bus and there's this moment out of the movies, seriously, she's just dreamy. And I'm looking at her and she says to me, you know, dear boy, Georgie Patton was a very, very naughty boy. Oh my goodness. I know, I was like, what? <laughs> what, is he, what are you saying? And I think she was meaning he was a prankster, but to me, I thought, oh, wow, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mom? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's some great scene in the book where he says something like, you know, you women are tougher than every one of these sons of bitches or whatever he says in the book. He, he actually loved Donut Dollies. We, we realized that. He, he had, he had a, a friend, a cousin, who was a Donut Dolly. So she was actually around and he was very sympathetic to them. And he thought, I think he thought they were tremendous. Um, so yeah, there was, there was a bunch of interaction. And you know he is the one who came and asked them to liberate Buchenwald and they didn't know what it was. You know, and one of the ugly ironies is that they thought they were they were American pilots. They thought it was a POW camp and they made ham sandwiches. They went with big baskets of ham sandwiches and then, what? Can you imagine? And I think it broke everybody who went. It, it, it affected Patton terribly and, um, you know, Jill, it was terrible. That was all she would offer. So I thought that that is denial, I think. And uh, I may have told you this before we went on, but when, when Jill would get upset, she'd just put her hand over her eyes for a minute. Not like my mom. She never flew off the handle. She'd say, I'm going to be sad now. I'm okay. Wow. I thought, dude. <laughs> This woman is made of iron, you know. She had a con she had a a, a a strong will and a control over what she was feeling. And I don't think my mom could could, you know. So I still have those pictures, and I people are around me are arguing that you know, you, well, you should donate them to this or that, and other people telling me, you know, you should always keep them. But I I, I think they belong somewhere. My yeah. dad, my dad has still has his father's trunk 
you know, was full of all these World War II treasures. And um, he went, not to make it about me, but he, he, his father traced the, the, a lot of the same terrain you're talking about. He was at the Battle of the Bulge and went up that whole route and was oh, amazed with the, you uh, got, uh, the bridge you got of the all that stuff. He oh, was, yeah. He was involved with that story. And, Dude, you've, you've got to send me his name and we'll put him in the paperback. <laughs> what? Cindy's like, don't make promises. We can do it. We'll just <laughs> make him into the paperback. That would be awesome. My dad would be so stoked. I know. I, I I did a lot of that kind of stuff. And by the way, that whole section in the beginning, third, where the, the grizzled captain of the the donut dollies gets up and gives them the speech. That's the that's the feminist version of the patent speech at the beginning of patent. I'll be damned. Yeah. Right. I had that in mind because I thought it's just such a stunning <laughs> opening to a film and a brilliant trope. But I thought if I put this right at the beginning, everybody will know that I'm ripping off Pat. But I just thought, let's hear this woman's version. Is that the Martha? Martha. Martha. Yeah. 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 Have you ever heard Tom Waits' version of Goodnight, Irene? No, I should look it up. Yeah, no, it's great. Yeah. Um, well, just, just briefly, um, you put Colette, uh, the resistance fighter, briefly in the book, dropped her in. I just learned about the documentary. Have you seen it? No. There's a documentary about her. Uh, really? Yeah. Wow. Which looks pretty fascinating. Wow. Yeah, because, you know, those women who who would risk everything to sort of charm a German and go down an alley and then pop in one. I'm, right. And that was that was a bit of a setup, too, for Hemingway, because Hemingway shows up all through the book in weird ways. His little shadow is everywhere. And, you know, he actually shows up. But the, the women are too busy to notice it's Hemingway over there. One of the ironies, you know, my mom in the liberation of Paris was looking everywhere for Hemingway. She was sure he was there and she saw him in a hotel having a drink with somebody. And, you know, it was like a dream come true to her. But she didn't say hi, hi Ernest, you know, she just watched him. Right. Now, um, a couple couple more things, then we'll wrap it up. But okay, is Jill's, you, you made reference to uh, uh, Jill, what was her last name again? Jill Pitts. Pitts. And then she was married, so her full name was Jill Pitts Knappenberger. You you said that there was a, a like a, a remembrance or some sort of manuscript that she'd written. Was it a like a has that been published anywhere? Or I don't think was it published. I don't think so. No, she just she, pardon. Is it interesting? Not really. She was okay. not a writer, and you'll get a real picture, I think, of what who she was because it's all about Jill. You wouldn't know she had partners or anything. Mm -hmm. Jill did this thing. Jill did that thing. She is right. Yeah, it was a yeah. Cindy was say is over there, and she's right that it it was written for her family. She wasn't trying to publish it. She just wanted to leave a record so they'd know, you know, what Jill did. And um, but it was it was so valuable. Other people's things give you an idea of what a wild woman she was. And it's talked about in the book a little bit. She got infected molar in Bastogne, right? And the, the, the siege hadn't really set in yet. And Jill wants to go back to Paris to get the tooth fixed. It's a couple of thousand miles from them or a thousand miles away. So she goes out on the highway and hit chikes. And some GIs come along and pick her up take her to Paris, she gets the thing pulled and then decides I'm in Paris, I'm staying here a couple of days and party and then hitchhike back to the front. And I thought, what? They, it gave me a sense of, sure, it was all traumatic, sure, it was all terrible, but also this freedom to live outside the proscribed norms right, of what right. women were supposed to do. She became, you know, Calamity Jane, <laughs> Annie Oakley. For a minute, it was it was fantastic. Well, sometimes you feel like, or, or you hear about soldiers, you know, combat veterans who it's like, you know, this was the best time of their life. You know, looking back, they look and uh, 
you know, you hear that said quite a bit, you know, I'll never feel that kind of sense of being alive, you know, uh, where things all of a sudden things are very simple. <laughs> things are very, you know, it's about yeah. living to the next day and all the trivial stuff that tends to occupy our minds most of the time all drops away, you know. Yeah, and it's in high definition too. Yes. You know, yes. it's um we 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 go to a, a gym in our neighborhood in Illinois, and there was a, a really sweet dude, a big burly guy, Marine, ex-Marine, had the tattoos, and he was a veteran of Afghanistan. Um and uh, he was a, a realtor that he loved, you know, he would talk to me about the book and, oh man, you know, he, this is good. You're making it. I said, well, well, you know, that's nice of you to say. And I said, though, I do have a dream of getting a lake house for Cindy. And he said, I'm on it. I'm on it. I'm going to find you the best lake house. And then he shot himself. Nobody had any idea at all. And the gym, just everybody fell apart because you would have never known. But then you start thinking about it. And this was a guy who could not get off the cell phone. Even working out, he'd take business calls or call. And the, the coach said, yeah, he worked. He worked around the clock. Worked, worked, worked. And then we all realized. And the terrible thing is he had kids, and but he just couldn't. And you think if he could have only gotten it off his chest somehow, but I don't know how they do. And one of our coaches is also a combat veteran, but he's, and you can tell it hurts, but, you know, he seems to be good. So it, it's there. If you look at the, the numbers right now of how many of our veterans are dying fast, um, you know, and I don't know if the women, what's happening to them. All of them, barring one woman, are gone from that era. She's 102 now. Um, but here's something, a little gift from God, actually. Uh, um, so we're going down to Denver tomorrow from up here, Aspen area. And uh, we're meeting with a bunch of Vietnam era donut dollies that are freaking out that somebody's written about them. And I'm starting to think that the stories are going to be amazing. So we're, just, we're meeting in a place, just us, and just talking. It'd be cool. It's funny because I was uh, I was thinking about uh, Michael Harris' <laughs> wonderful book Dispatch. Oh, it's the best book. Yes. When I was reading your scenes of you know when when the the women are in the French village under attack, and there's that kind of surreality of it all, you know. Yeah. And Hare captures it beautifully, and you know, it's dreamlike in some weird way, and nothing makes sense, and. Um, that that whole passage, although fiction and fictionalized, I tried to make it representative of so many of the events that some of these women went through. And my mom experienced at least three major things that are in that scene. And that became the backbone of, of that, that section. And that is also, you know, the, that pivot point when the relationship between the two women changes. Right. Um, but yeah, she she spent she spent time listening to the tanks tear down buildings, and she they they turned down a man's begging pleas to rescue his daughter, and they never found them again. And uh, they well, she I don't think Jill was there, but my mom hid in a barn under hay, and listened to the Germans first. And then Russian troops who came into the town doing violence to the women. And honestly, between you and me, I think that was the nightmare because she was in the dark, under hay, unarmed, terrified. And she's hearing the women screaming in the dark. And uh, she suggested that she prayed, please just let them keep busy out there. Don't let me be found. And I think she felt like she had damned herself for praying that. But, you know, it was fear. It was fear. And I think she, you know, I, I honestly think that the sounds are what made her cry at night. Yeah. We haven't even mentioned Garcia. And he's Garcia. 
Zoot <laughs> plays such a role in the book, and he actually saves, <laughs> saves their lives, right? I mean, he does. He totally saves their lives. And I thought, what am I going to do? Because, you know, I part of me was like kind of paranoid that the Rasa would be like, oh man, now you're writing a book about white ladies. And, you know, but I was like, no, you don't think I'm not going to put in. And I always tell them, see how many Latinos are actually in the soldiers. There's a lot of Mexicans and, you know, but um, yeah, Zoot Suit, Zoot Garcia, as I told you before we got on the air from my first book, In Search of Snow. Gila Bang. Yeah. yeah, he's the, he's the, he's the, the fellow, they're a dynamic duo of guys and he's haunted by what he saw at Buchenwald. And it took me 30 some years to get a book in which I can have him express what it was like. And I won't talk about his introduction in the book, but I thought I'm gonna give this guy a completely spectacular, weird, surreal, cinematic, you know, like uh, El Topo kind of a shocking, surreal image. And uh, I was so happy. That's one of the things I'm happiest about in the whole book is when we first see it. I was just like, yeah, sometimes you just think, oh, I just did that, you know? That was cool. That, was, that made me happy. See, and I picture, you know, your book ending and then James Elroy's Black Dahlia opening with the Zoot Suit riots in LA. Yeah. And Garcia's one of these cats that came back from the war, you know, who's in LA. <laughs> Well, you know, um, it's interesting. I, the audio book is out and I didn't, I do my, as you know, most of my own audio books, but I, I thought it would be so absurd to have me acting all these women's voices. It just, I wanted a woman to do it. And they got a wonderful woman, a, a, an actress from New York. And well, as they were recording, they, they, they called me and they said, how do, what does that Zoot Suit accent sound? How am I going to do this? And so we told him, well, rent Zoot Suit. Listen to Edward James Olmos do that role. And understand that when he's talking as Zoot Suit, it's performative. The language, all the rigmarole is camouflage. It's a weapon. And then when he's himself, he's himself. And they did. She studied the, the accents. It's wonderful. And she's got that sort of head a hopper 40s style English that she can unleash. So I thought, I never thought of that, you know, the way they sound in those old movies. So yeah, Zoot is my boy. <laughs> That's awesome. Now just to kind of to kind of take it in for landing, um yeah. before we got going, I was asking you about, you know, now that you've been on the road for weeks now, uh, have you had lots? I'm sure lots of people have come out of the woodwork sharing oh. their families' wartime experiences. Can you talk oh, about yeah. that? What it, maybe give us a couple of examples. I've, I've got one that's perfect. We're still both jingle jangling over it, right? We were in Seattle. Like I said, we're, we're, we, got, we bought a new uh, SUV hybrid all wheel drive. And we thought we're going to make this our club mobile and we're going to drive all over every city we go to. We find, ask everybody who's the best donut shop and, and we go get their donuts and then take their pictures. And it's been fun. Right. And every once in a while we get a third girl in the, in the truck, including males. I make them, you're the first male third girl in the truck. <laughs> but um, so we were in Seattle and uh, it was a, a lovely event. And uh, when people were coming up, to get their book signed, this woman came down and she showed me a photograph, black and white picture of a woman in uniform leaning on a donut truck. And I said, oh my God. Yeah, and she told me her mom's name. And I said, that's a, that's a club mobile. And she was kind of like, is it? I said, yeah, yeah. I, I thought maybe she, she never talked about it. And I said, well, what, what was the name of the truck? I said, well, what group was she in? I don't know. So she gave us the name and we had research materials that we take with us, what little there is outside of our own snooping around. And we were able to find out the name of her mom's truck, what group she was in. She was in the same group as my mom, which means it was group F, which means she knew my mom. 
That woman in that picture knew my mom, did service with her. They probably parked their trucks together sometimes. And the coolest thing, which Cindy found, always, always have a reporter with you, her mother's truck in the liberation of Paris was the first truck that drove through the Arc de Triomphe. Wow. Imagine giving somebody that. You know, and I thought just for that, I feel like it was worth all of this to just be able to do something like that is so cool. And and since there's no official place really to 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 hunt it down, how would she have ever known? Right. right? Yeah. Now you, you mentioned Vietnam. Um when did the program end, or is it still in some form around? Yeah. <laughs> you saw apocalypse now, right? I think yeah. that. Oh yeah, I think Vietnam was a whole other kettle of fish, and it didn't. It didn't. I don't think last. It didn't fly. No, I, I yeah. I'm going to ask them about this because I'm really curious about it. I'm always thinking about you know that catastrophic scene where the Playboy bunnies try to entertain the troops, and there's a riot, and they have to be flown out of helicopters. And one person that said to us, "Well, you know, LSD changed a lot of things." <laughs> yeah, I guess it did. But yeah. these women are, you know, and I'm realizing they're they're my age because I always think of them as these 35 or 27, whatever year old women that, you know, they want to talk. And I'm so excited about it. It's going to be cool. I think I'm going to have to write about it. I think I'm going to tell them. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell them when we get together, we need to put your experience somewhere. Absolutely. If you if you trust me, we'll do it. The team will do it. I bet they'll wow. say. What about the inevitable film question? Have you sold the film rights to the book yet, or will you? No, but there there are people that are starting to show interest now. I think you know the the, the film world. I, I've optioned out a lot of books. They've never been filmed, and I realized, oh yeah, here we take that money and forget about the book whatever you know we can get a car or a down payment on a house um but there's something about this that's making people have such strong responses uh, and i know there's a british company that's very interested in it which is cool because most of it's going to have to be filmed there in New right. europe um and uh some canadian folks are you know just people are starting to talk about it and I think I think Hollywood's probably fairly cautious right now. And the various strikes, I think, have just slowed everything down anyway. But my agent is is always burning up the phones. And there are a lot of fans, but I don't know if anybody wants to try to venture, you know, a streaming Game of Thrones style monster like that. I don't know. It's not I don't know if they can do it cheaply, if you think about it. No. But it's going out. People are reading it, so we'll see. I'm not going to worry about it. I think, you know, I did my job. I love, I love how it came out. I love how people are responding to it. Um, you know, if I always tell my agent, you know, I, you got to find Lady Brienne of Tarth. She's six too. Because <laughs> I just want to talk to her. I don't care. I want to, you know, take her to to Barney's Beanery and just talk to her. But, now I read somewhere, maybe on your website, that you're uh, you're writing about TJ now. Tijuana. Well, see, well, it's 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 a it's a fanciful history of Tijuana, sort of magical realist. Um, it's called the Zebras of Tijuana, oh. and uh, it's a picaresque. I've noticed you might have noticed this, but I I I tend to write a couple of soul crushing books. And then I flee from all that stuff and write something comedic. So, you know, I, I had Devil's Highway and then The Hummingbird's Daughter finally came out. And I was just like, no more, no more. And I wrote uh, Into the Beautiful North because I thought, I'm going to write a book that makes me laugh every day. I didn't know if I was going to publish it or not, but I did that sort of to cleanse the palate, you know. And then a couple more things. And then I write House of Broken Angels, which destroyed me it's about my brother's death and then this thing which was both um uplifting but also unbelievably difficult painful 
Uh, and so I thought, oh, hell, man, I'm going to go back to Tijuana and sing its praises one last time, perhaps, um, and write about weird things that I loved about Tijuana, like they're, they're painted donkeys. Why do they have donkeys painted like zebras? What started that? They even call them zonkeys. They've got a name for them. Los zonkeys, the Tijuana. So, you know, it's, it's just by its nature, fun. How far along with that are you? <laughs> mm, I blew right through my delivery date working on Irene. So they very kindly moved it on down the road. But I think everybody knew that this was, I, I you know, Irene feels like a pinnacle. I don't know if I can, you know, I, I would be really happy after Zebras of Tijuana to just publish haiku and stuff, you know? Maybe it's time for a crime novel. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always asking Hurwitz to coach me on this, you know. How do I do that thing? And no, he's... man, you, you did win an Edgar Award, didn't you? Yes, but it was an accident. <laughs> I got an accidental Edgar our, for a story. Our little, our little project. That was awesome. <laughs> I know. You got me the Edgar, buddy. That was, that was, it was incredible. I was so flummoxed, I didn't even know what to say. I kind of apologized to everybody on stage. And that was that year that Lee Child was the MC. <laughs> it was uh, so cool. He was so kind. And the one thing he said when they gave me that Edgar, he came over and he said, be very careful with it. The head breaks off so easily. And I got on the plane and broke Edgar's head right off. Did you really? Yeah, we glued him back together, but... That seems appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Luis, thanks so much. Um, Thank you, Patrick. Everybody, go out and get this remarkable book. Get several copies. Give them to your friends. <laughs> um, it's funny because I was telling my my folks about it. You know, um, you know, my dad comes from a long military family, and he's very interested in these stories. And uh, I, think, I think they're going to do it for his book group, which is kind of cool. Seriously? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, tell them to call me. I will. I'll, I'll zoom in with them because I, I like doing that. Well, that'd be a blast. I will. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love it. Well, thanks again. And thanks, everybody. Thank you, brother. And um, we'll talk to you soon, Luis.